Hello, and thank you for joining me. My name is Donovan from Salt of the Streets, and this is the final review preview for 2022, and the first one for 2023. So, we've got a lot of stuff going on here, but first, I want to thank everybody for joining me for the book club. If you stayed here and you read every book on the book club last year, then you read 11 books. That's pretty incredible, especially because most people don't fucking read at all. They don't read a magazine. All they read is their phone, social media, Facebook, Instagram, anything. So if you read every book last year, you read 11 books from front to back. Some of them as short as just over 200 pages and some of them over 350. That's a huge deal. That is a huge deal. And they were all across the spectrum from what well, Rubicon. And we also read some, some self-help books on like how to have impossible conversations and the coddling of the American mind. We read all kinds of different books last year. World War Z, all these things. We read a fiction book together. I never read fiction books. It was great. So I'm proud of everybody who was here. And I thank you because you guys helped keep me accountable. And I think we helped push each other forward. The review previews were good. The live streams are great. We're not going to do those anymore. But we'll get into that later. But this was great. So I want to thank everybody and congratulate you, myself, from the leader of the book club, from the Soldier Studies Book Club. You crushed it. You killed it. You're all warriors. You're soldiers. You're patriots. We're out here. I'm proud of everybody. You are above average. Absolutely. Absolutely above average. Because most people don't read 11 books, right? I finished the year... 18 was my number 18 books there were certain times where i was reading two three books at a time and that's how i got through that right five books at one point i was getting wild right when i was in high school yeah i was peaking with three or four and i was like i'm trying to get back to like this i'm trying to crush this so i did at one point it was a little much then the baby came couldn't do that anymore it was only the beginnings that i was really crushing the five books but the point being you guys killed it, and I'm proud of you, and I'm excited to kick off this next year, 2023 Book Club, Salt of the Streets. I have a whole stack of books for us. It's going to be incredible. First, we're going to talk about Jarhead, and then we'll get into this new stack, but you can kind of get some peeps at it you know, while we're doing the Jarhead uh, review. So let's just get into it, right? Jarhead was awesome. I was really terrified when I started this book that I wasn't going to like it because I liked it so much in high school. And I was like, maybe I have outgrown it or it's just a different writing style. I just don't, whatever. Not the case, right? The writing style of Anthony Swafford is a lot like my own. There's a lot of emotion in it. It breaks from traditional writing style. It isn't it's it's just it's different than normal right but it's still very easy to read some people with non-traditional writing styles can be very difficult to read jordan is really not a fan of chuck palinuk right the guy who wrote fight club he also wrote another book named choke that i was a big fan of that i got jordan to read once she didn't finish it because she just couldn't deal with his writing style it breaks up a lot a lot of really short sentences and skipping paragraphs things like that she's just not into it right some of those things like i said can be very difficult to read through a lot of like diary style books right like uh what is this this one that we're going to do um it's this one devolution right that's like a diary style book some of those can be difficult to read some just first person books can be difficult to read if they are not written well just depends right this one was not that way i really really enjoyed it um when i read this book in high school i had absolutely zero knowledge of the vietnam war i knew that it had happened and you know i think if you asked me the time i probably would have said something like the vietnam war is a war that you know that we never should have been in like something like that because i was super based and uh you know really anti-war and shit in high school so and super like, lefty yeah yeah precisely so it would have been something to that effect but i couldn't have told you why you know or backed up that statement at all it would have just been like we 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 lost because we never should have been there that would have been so now obviously i my answer is the same but for a, a much much different reason and I could defend it for probably hours at a time. But the point being, right, the level of involvement, I also was unaware of the level of involvement that the U.S. had in Ukraine at that time. It was much, much lower than it is now. But we still, we were involved in coups that were going on there. And we were still funding them a lot. We were giving them a lot of money. Like these things were still happening there. So the context that I had for the framing of the book was only the conflict in the middle of the in the middle east that was all that i had was just afghanistan and even then i graduated high school in 2013 so you're talking about even only two-thirds of the war there still was so much left to happen i'm pretty sure uh osama bin laden was dead like that had happened the raid and everything had happened but um no uh, that was still very new. You know, all of this was still very new. So even the war itself had not 
gone to the point that we know and i mean now we've seen the the field withdrawal i mean all of these things right so the context even then was just an incomplete war of us kind of realizing okay we really have been fucking up for 14 years um so i can only i can only remember so much about my mind frame of the book at the time and how i was processing it um but i know for certain that it wasn't with the level of depth and understanding that i have now for this context you know it was it I'm certain that it was just much more of a pure reading of experience, you know, that I can't believe somebody dealt with this in their life. I can't believe that somebody could deal with this and still come out on the other end. And and I still obviously very much feel that way, but I have so much more understanding of the different complexities that went into the lifestyle that Anthony Swafford lived and why someone would get there, why they would want to serve in the military like this, because even though in high school I wanted to serve in the military, I didn't get the killing people thing, you know, this. So um, I was blissfully unaware of how closely the conflicts in the Middle East would align with that in Vietnam. And if you have watched the show for a period of time, then you know when we withdrew from Afghanistan, we did a whole, whole long segment on how those were compared, right? Um, So some ways that they were similar, right? Whether it is the lack of preparation or information being given to those that are serving. And I have my first reading that we'll go into here. I almost brought the other copy of the book, like the first one that I have. And that would have fucked up my whole reading thing. Cause I have the pages written down in my, it would have fucked up the whole jam. It does cover missing. Or... Yeah. Yeah. It would have been really bad. I, then I forgot to bring the dust cover, but I'm going to buy you nothing but fucking paperback from now on just to bother you. <laughs> Okay, so I was blissfully unaware of how closely the conflicts in the Middle East would align with that in Vietnam. Whether it is the lack of preparation or information being given to those that are serving. All right, so this is from page 182. The next afternoon, we are given further instruction in NBC, Nuclear, Biological, and Chemical Defense. We listen to an officer from Division NBC tell us again that PB pyrodostigmonine bromide pills aren't harmful, then in fact they will help us, like all the other things in the Marine Corps insist we ingest. The officer disperses atropine and oxamine injectors and PB pill packs. The PB is intended to enhance the effects of the atropine and oxime post-exposure antidote that will, with any luck, self-administer to reduce the likelihood of dying from the nerve agent that we've been attacked with, such as somine, an agent that produces what the NBC officer calls, quote, immediate casualties. Kuhn wonders aloud why we've already taken one cycle of PB and are just now being issued the atropine and oxamine injectors, but Seek tells him, shut the fuck up, Kuhn, as often happens when Kuhn asks hard questions we like answered. Everything the Division NBC officer tells us we know already because we've already been trained for the effects of nuclear, biological, and chemical attacks since roughly the eighth week of boot camp, a long time in the past for most of us. If rather than offering a detailed and gory refresher course on nerve agents and their effects, the officer had simply said, Hey, I know you jarheads know all this NBC crap because we've been training it since boot camp, and I'm not here to tell you what you already know. I just want to give you a heads up and make sure you understand that such an attack is not imminent, but possible. And if concerning the PB appeals, our staff sergeant had said something other than, We will have three formations per day, and in each formation, you will take one of these goddamn pills. Don't fucking ask me what it is. I'm taking it too. Do you want to fucking live, or do you want to fucking die? We we might not be walking around our fighting holes with our bodies and minds full, not only of NBC defense knowledge and pyrodistamine bromide, but also of fear and terror. We swallow these PB pills not because we need to, but because the intelligence is incorrect. The people at the Pentagon received bad dope concerning the number of Iraqi chemical warheads in Kuwait, and they didn't know about the bad dope, but when they knew that when soldiers and Marines, good old rough American boys, started dropping dead on the battlefield from nerve gas, the drop-dead fighter the only flawless indicator of a chemical attack, the public perception of the war being a good war and worth fighting would change. I'm sure these Pentagon guys suffered nightmares, not because they were ingesting PB pills or because they lived and breathed and shat with gas masks fastened to their body, but from watching the movie all quiet on the Western Front during their lunch breaks. With chemically dead fighters on their hands, the political soldiers of the Pentagon would look bad for not doing all they could to protect the fighting soldiers and Marines, and the public relations war that the Pentagon had been winning would sway toward the side of peace and diplomacy, because after Vietnam, no one wants to see great numbers of the boys coming home dead, no matter the proposed importance of the battle, be it a fight against communism or for the stability of 40% of the world's oil fields. So the political soldiers had to find something that would promote the public sham of a Pentagon dedicated to the safety and warfare of its troops. 
enter PB pills. None of this has anything to do with the individual lives that might be lost to nerve gas, the immediate casualties, and everything to do with public relations battle, the real battle occurring in America. We enter our fighting holes and our fear and our terror with us. The division NBC officer has fucked us, jinxed us, diddled us in the ass. If you're listening to our banter, you will not hear the pleasure coming from our holes. You will hear despair. We have no confidence in our protective gear. How will we be saved? Later, I will read that pyrodistamine bromide has been approved under the condition of full disclosure. That is, the troops must be informed fully of the potential effects of PB, both positive and negative, and then the individual service member will choose whether he or she wants to take the pills. This, of course, is not the way it works in the military. The history books tell me we are supposed to take the PB pills three times a day for a week. I recall ingesting many more pills than 21 for longer than a week. It makes sense that we would want to take more of the pills, even though we have no idea of the possible side effects. Why not take more of something that you've been told might save your life? If 21 pills are good, 42 must be better, and 63 will turn me golden. Now we stand in our normal platoon formation, two ranks of 12 men, two scout teams per rank, and Staff Sergeant Seek issues the orders. Remove one pill from your PB pack. Place the pill on your tongue. Stick your tongue out so I can see the pill. Take your canteen from your war belt and swallow water and the pill. Show me your tongue. Now, don't you feel better? Kuhn is the only one of us who spits his pills out and buries them in the desert. Kuhn isn't smart enough to rebel against ingesting an experimental drug into his body, but he's angry enough to rebel against anything the Marine Corps orders him to do that doesn't produce immediate and positive results. Me, I'm afraid. I rarely, if ever, disobey orders. I believe that the Iraqi army has tens of thousands of artillery rounds filled with chemical weapons. In my dark fantasies, the chemicals are gassy and green or yellow and floating around the warhead. The warhead on its way to me, my personal warhead, whistling its way to earth into my little hole. I too think of all quiet on the Western Front. I can't remember if chemicals were used in the book or the movie, but I know that during the early years of the Great War, nerve gas killed tens of thousands, and I don't want to die that old, terrible way. Not the way of books or movies, but the way of war. I know that in 1987 and 1988, Saddam Hussein attacked Iraqi Kurds with chemical weapons, and that thousands died and suffered, and that already deformed children are being born to victims of the attacks. Children with seven or eight toes per foot, without anal openings, blind babies, stillborn babies, babies so retarded they'll be dead within years or killed sooner out of mercy and despair. I take the pills. Whether it's the pure disorganization opening the door for insane mistakes to be made, this is from page 218. Our team has been ordered to the point of the battalion because the staff sergeant and the captain and the colonel have faith in our leadership, but this does not matter. What matters is that the rounds might hit us first. Kuhn complains more than usual about the heat and all the wasted oil burning up and disappearing in the air. Doc John calls us crazy jarheads and quizzes us on inserting breathing tubes, treating sucking chest wounds, and administering IVs. Deadman says something about missing his Harley. Martinez says he wishes he was in corpus. And only feet above our heads, the sky splits open as a round passes over. The sound is like a thousand bolts of lightning striking at once. Kuhn yells, what the fuck was that? Martina says, I thought we got our goddamn tanks. Stay down, Johnny yells. Swafi, get me visual. Rounds pass directly over our heads while I retrieve my spotter scope from my ruck. As they pass over, it's as though all sound and time and space in their path are sucked into the rounds. A five-ton truck blows up 100 yards behind us. Its water buffalo also blows into a large bloom of 500 gallons of water, and another five-ton takes a hit. I gain visual. The tanks shooting at us are M60A1s. Friendlies. I yell to Johnny, It's our own tanks! He gets belly down on the deck and looks through my scope and yells, It's Ripper! The Task Force Ripper tanks are northeast of our position, and even with their naked eyeballs too grand out, they should have known we were friendly. Unlike the minor enemy assaults with artillery and rockets we've experienced over the past days, we know that our own guys will not stop until the entire convoy and all nearby personnel are annihilated, because that is the way of the Marine Corps. We are fighting ourselves, but we can't shoot back. It's true that we moved into a flat that an hour before had been a fortified enemy position, but that is no excuse. An hour of war is a lifetime, as a few supply convoy marines have discovered. More rounds pass over. Johnny dials the Ripper executive officer and asks, Who the fuck do your tanks think they're shooting at to their southeast? It's fucking friendlies. It's fucking friendlies. It's me, it's my team you're shooting at, and our battalion and the goddamn supply convoy, you motherfuckers, you lousy dicks. 
and Johnny continues to scream at the man, and I hear in his voice astonishment and rage because all the things that Johnny believes in, the superiority of the sniper and the importance of the small unit. First, he believes in the Marine Corps and that the Marine Corps takes care of its own, as in it doesn't kill its own, and even though he knows different, just like the rest of us, he knows he's never experienced the horribly sublime reality of Marine Corps tanks shooting at you and hitting your very own supply convoy. And strangely enough, hearing the loud, screeching, friendly fire rounds rip overhead, the rounds pulling all time and space with them, is more mysterious and thrilling and terrifying than taking the fire from the enemy, because the enemy fire made sense, but the friendly fire makes no sense. No matter the numbers and statistics that the professors of the military colleges will put up on transparencies, friendly fire is fucked fire, and it makes no sense and cannot be told in numbers. Word is that only two men died and six were injured at the hands of the trigger-happy and blind tankers. I don't believe this, because the damage is extreme. Three five-tons and a Humvee are burning and Marines are swarming around the vehicles. The carnage is only 100 yards behind me, but it might as well be 10,000 yards away and many years past. I want to run back to the vehicles and make my own body count, but I cannot. I know my job is to forget what I've seen. Lieutenants and sergeants are yelling up and down the ranks for us to get off our asses and start moving forward. There's still a goddamn war here that needs to be won. But it didn't require that much time. Even then, Swafford could see how similar his war was to his father's, and the horror of war never changes. This is from page 222. This is war, I think. I'm walking through what my father and his father walked through. The epic results of American bombing, American might. The filth is in my boots. I am one of a few thousand people who will walk this valley today. I am history making. Whether I live or die, the United States will win this war. I know that the United States will win any war it fights against any country. If colonialism weren't out of style, I'm sure we'd take over the entire Middle East. Not only safeguard the oil reserves, but take the oil reserves. We are here to announce that you no longer own your own country. Thank you for your cooperation. More details will follow. Our rucks are heavy with equipment and ammunition, but even heavier with the burdens of history. And each step we take, the burden increases. The sky is dead gray from the oil fires billowing to the north. We hump and hump and look at one another with blank, amazed faces. Is this what we've done? What will I tell my mother? Troy says to me, I feel sorry for those poor bastards. They didn't have a chance. We stop for a water break. A few feet behind me, a bombed jeep sits on the road. A corpse is at the wheel, sitting erect, looking serious, seeming almost to squint at the devastation, the corpse's face not unlike our faces. What has happened? Bombs. Bombs. Big bombs and small bombs, all of them filled with explosives meant to kill you. On either side of the jeep, more corpses. Two near me, one not. All belly to the desert, as if they are running from the bomb, as if running would have helped. The backsides of the corpses are charred and decaying, the bottom halves buried in the sand. The sand, wind smeared like cake icing against the bodies, and I wonder if the bottom halves of the men are still living, buried by the mirage, unaware that death lurks above. Maybe the men are screaming into the earth, living their half-lives, hoping to be heard. What would they tell me? Run. I assume the men were screaming before the A-10 or A-6 dropped its bombs, but maybe they were on their way to Kuwait City for supplies. And it was the evening, and the men neither saw nor heard the plane that dropped on them. Perhaps one of the men was telling a dirty joke or repeating a rumor he'd heard about the Major's wife. But they must have been screaming. I hear them now. This is from page 224. On the other side of the rise, bodies and vehicles are everywhere. The wind blows. I assume this is what remains of an Iraqi convoy that had stopped for the night. Twelve vehicles, eight troop carriers, and four supply trucks are in a circle. Men are gathered dead around what must have been their morning or evening fire. This is disturbing, not knowing what meal they were eating. I'm looking at an exhibit in a war museum, but there are no curators, no docents, no benefactors with their names chiseled into marble. The benefactors wish to remain anonymous. Two large bomb depressions on either side of the circle of vehicles look like the marks of a fist would make in a block of clay. A few men are dead in the cabs of the trucks, and the hatch of one troop carrier is open, bodies on bodies inside it. The men around the fire are bent forward to the waist, sitting dead on large steel ammunition boxes. The corpses are badly burned and decaying, and when the wind shifts up the rise, I smell and taste their death, like a moist, rotten sponge shoved into my mouth. I vomit into my mouth. I swish the vomit around before expelling it, as though it will cover the stink and taste of the dead men. I walk toward the fire circle. There is one vacant ammunition box. The dead men fell to the side. I pulled my crackers from my pocket. 
I spit into the fire hole and join the circle of the dead. I open my crackers. So close to it, on top of it, I barely notice the hollow smell of death. The fire looks to be many days old, sand and windswept. Six tin coffee cups sit among the remains of the fire. The men's boots are cooked to their feet. The man to my right has no head. To my left, the man's head is between his legs, and his arms hang at his sides like the burnt flags of defeated countries. The insects of the dead are swarming. Though I can make out no insignia, I imagine that the man across from me has commanded the unit, and that when the bombs landed, he was in the middle of issuing a patrol order. Tomorrow, we will kick some American ass. It would be silly to speak, but I'd like to. I want to ask the dead men their names and identification numbers and tell them this will soon end. They must have questions for me, but the distance between the living and the dead is too immense to breach. I could bend at the waist, close my eyes, and try to join these men in their tight, dead circle, but I am not yet one of them. I must not close my eyes. The sand surrounding me is smoky and charred. I feel as though I've entered this mirage. The dead Iraqis are poor company, but the presence of so much death reminds me that I'm alive, whatever awaits me to the north. I realize I may never again be so alive. I can see everything and nothing. This moment with the dead men has made my past worth living and my future, always uncertain, now has value. Over the rise, I hear the call to get on the road. I hear my name, two syllables. Troy is calling, and now Johnny and Troy again. I throw my crackers into the gray fire pit. I try, but I cannot speak. I taste my cocoa on Pear's vomit. I join my platoon on the other side. So I fear that as a country, we will never learn from our mistakes in regard to Vietnam and Afghanistan and Iraq because the consequences so rarely fall on those that make the decisions, right? Unless you're Joe Biden and your kid dies in the war, right? Um, that's a good joke. Throughout this reading, I was continuously thinking of Ukraine and what our future looks like there, right? So it's very interesting that what we just talked about. Um, on the mental front, this book is modern warfare. This is precisely what this looks like. The effects, what people are experiencing, the dropping of bombs from fucking from drones, right? This is modern warfare. The tactics and the tools may have changed from this book to Ukraine, but the mental effects can be predicted and they they must be addressed. It's 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 far past time. As we tiptoe closer to another war, we owe it to those people who will serve to educate ourselves on the effects of what we're asking them to do and to prepare ourselves to care for them when they come home. And if we don't, then events like this in the desert. This is from page 103. A few days later, in the barracks of the rear rear, I hold my locked and loaded M16 against Detman's left temple. Meyer sits on his rack and pretends not to notice. I haven't planned on threatening to kill Detman. And when cleaning my weapons, first my sniper rifle and then my M16, Detman and I have been competing in a weapons assembly race with our M16s, sitting cross-legged and facing each other. I've beaten him 30 times in a row, by two or three seconds each try, and I've become tired of the routine. And it's last time after I yell, done, I simply lock and load a 30-round magazine, rub the muzzle against Detman's temple, and ask, what would you say if I told you I was going to kill you for fucking me like that? I know this is crazy and reckless, but I think Detman might learn something. I don't know what. And I know that if in a second I say fuck it and pull the trigger, I'll be able to lie my way through an accidental discharge and the Detmans in North Dakota will be sad and I will probably spend some time in the brig and maybe even years. But I'll be the fuck out of Saudi Arabia and the endless waiting and the various other forms of mental and physical waste and also I'll finally know what it feels like to kill a man. I say, Ellie Bose, I am in the firing position known as the sitting position. After the prone position, it is considered the most stable shooting platform for the M16. In other words, the platform most likely to enable the Marine to effectively kill his target, his target being a human, generally an enemy, but sometimes, by mistake, a friend or friendly. We call this friendly fire, friendly fucking, or getting friendly fucked. Sounds like a finger fuck, but it feels much different, I'm sure. Detman apologizes for falling asleep on watch. He thinks that my killing him is a severe reaction. He says, come on, Swaff, I'm sorry. I don't think you'll pull the trigger. You're just fucking with me. I say to Myers, what do you think, Myers? Do you think I'll kill your homeboy from boot camp? Sure you'll kill him. It excites me to know that Myers believes I'll kill his friend. You two have known each other for almost five months now. You're some salty motherfuckers. That's why Ellie Bowes can fall asleep on Firewatch. She's so damn salty she doesn't have to do what her team leader tells her. Myers, you don't see shit, right? I'm not here. This isn't even my room. Ellie Bowes, I say. After I put this bullet in your head, I'm going to drag you over to Coon's room and let him throw that mop on your head and let him go to town. How does that sound? 
Come on, Swaff. I'm sorry. I really screwed up. I was just sitting there, bored as fuck, thinking about home. I'm tired of this shit, just like you. You're tired? You've been here for three weeks. I worked the muzzle around his ear. Let me get that wax. You didn't learn to clean your ears in boot camp, did you? Don't you know that hygiene is the second most important thing to bullets on the battlefield? This 556 will clean your dirty ear. I don't know what's more nervous, me or Detman, but I continue to talk. And as I talk, I soothe myself and come closer to believing that I can finish this reckless, this reckless act. I am, after all, a trained killer, and my heart has been hardened so as to allow death to enter. I don't know Detman, and I don't like Detman. He's a goddamn boot who's eating corn and pig and spraying at the farmhouse table when I deployed to Saudi. I have more in common with the Iraqi soldiers at the Kuwaiti border, men who dug in a few days before I landed in Riyadh, than I do with Detman. The loss of Detman won't be a loss, but an inconvenience. A little bloody mess. I alternate my muzzle between his ear and his pulsing temple. We discuss the ballistic possibilities depending on the bullet's point of entry and the technical specifics of the M16 rifle. I tell Detman to repeat after me. The M16A2 service rifle is an air-assisted gas rifle that fires a 5.56mm ball projectile. Maximum range 3,534 feet. Maximum effective range for the point target is 550 meters. Maximum effective range for the area target is 800 meters. Cyclical fire rate, 800 rounds per minute. Average rate of fire, 10 to 12 rounds per minute. Sustained rate of fire, 12 to 15 rounds per minute. Muzzle velocity, 3,100 feet per second. Detman's ears are blood red and he's weeping. His eyes are shut tight like a corn husk so the tears must force their way out one drop at a time. Rifle weight, 7.78 pounds, 8.79 pounds fully loaded with a 30 round magazine. Rifle length, 39.62 inches, 44.87 inches with a fixed bayonet. The bayonet weighs 0 0.60 pounds. The rifle cleaning kit and cleaning lubricant protectant are stored in the buttstock of the rifle. The key to a properly functioning M16A2 is weapons maintenance and love. Detman is shaking his head at no as he speaks. Snot runs from his nose. This is my rifle. There are many like it, but this one is mine. My rifle is my best friend. Without me, my rifle is nothing. Without my rifle, I am nothing. Detman opens, opens his eyes wide. He looks as though he's experienced a religious epiphany. He's moving his lips, but I can't understand what he's saying. He's spitting as he tries to speak. His ears have turned an even deeper red, and his cheeks are flushed, and he's sobbing violently, his head bobbing like a bark on a rough sea. I push the magazine release button and my magazine clanks against the deck. I discharge the round from the chamber and force the round into Detman's mouth, like a dentist forcing a painful tool through the tight lips of a child. It stays there. I throw my rifle onto the deck, and the sound of the hard plastic handguards and the rifle metal bounce against the concrete is not unlike the mad clatter of a New Orleans funeral march returning to the city of the grave. Turn into events like this at home. This is from page 117. I heard from Fergus two more times. A year or so later, he called one morning at four. He said he was on his cell phone. Inside the U-Haul, he'd loaded that afternoon in the Queen Anne neighborhood of Seattle. He was skipping out on his rent and moving to a Colorado to hook up with Smith, another former stay Marine. He had all of his belongings and his motorcycle loaded, and he planned to sleep in the U-Haul overnight so that his entire life couldn't be stolen from him. Why are you calling me? I asked. He'd been drinking at his favorite nearby bar, he said, hoping to hook up with the bartender one last time. Her blue eyes and blonde hair were amazing. When finally he'd stopped trying after last call, on his walk up the hill he'd come upon two guys beating on a middle-aged gay man across the street, and he yelled two or three times for the men to stop, and they wouldn't. So finally he pulled his pistol and shot at the men. He didn't care whom he'd hit as long as the attack stopped, and he was sure he'd scored a hit because one of the assailants fell and the gay man ran away, and the other attacker began screaming over the body of his friend. After Fergus had fired the shot, he'd shit his pants. He'd heard sirens and people yelling from apart windows. Then he'd run. I told him to bury his gun in one of the packing boxes and get in the cab of the truck and drive away to Portland and to pull over downtown and sleep, to clean his weapon the Marine Corps style the next morning and then toss it over one of the bridges and to never call me again and never tell anyone what had happened. He called to collect a few months later from a phone booth in Durango, Colorado. He and Smith had been getting at fist mites with each other. After a few weeks, he moved into abandoned building and an old bank, he told me, and he had his Marine Corps. Issue caught set up in the basement vault and through a contraption of hoses and buckets and gravity he'd assembled sort of a field shower. Not a shower really, but more like being pissed on from above. He felt good about the future, he liked his surroundings, and he felt certain he'd take a few theater classes at the community college next semester. I asked him if maybe he should talk to someone at the Veterans Administration building, and he declined, insisting that they could not tell him anything he didn't already know. But after we hung up, he said, We fired the same rifle. You have the same problems as me. And it happens because of stupidity like this.
This is from page 113. One evening, two German women in their mid-twenties asked if we knew the way to Amboy. We did, and we also knew that they wanted to go to the desolate desert town to say they'd bid somewhere Charles Manson had called home. They asked us to escort them in their orange V-dub bus. There was a quarry outside of Amboy, and the yellow lights from the quarry burned all night, and when Greenies made their first training mission to the Palms, the Salts would tell stories about Marines being abducted and cooked in a stew that burned night and day, fueled by the hate and madness of Manson children. We drove toward the yellow lights and told the German women the same stories that Salt had been telling Boots for 20 years. The women seemed to believe us, and I saw in the rearview mirror both fear and pleasure in the driver's face. I don't recall their names, only that they weren't especially pretty and were extraordinarily muscular rather than lithe like many female climbers, and that neither had showered for a few days. The women were rather disappointed when they realized the menacing yellow lights burned from the border of the quarry and that no monuments or statues honored Manson. And Boy had one gas station and two diners, one of which had a hand-painted sign in the window that read, If you're looking for Charlie Manson, you're already dead. On the return drive, the women abused us verbally for being U.S. Marines. The passenger laughed that we would dare call Desert Storm a war, and she told us her uncle had helped burn thousands of Jews before escaping to South America, and no matter what side a person had fought for in World War II, that was a war. Not an operation with boys returning home complaining of false ailments because they hadn't fought long or hard enough. I told her quite confidently that our war was important, not because of duration or the number of dead and tortured and burned, but simply because we'd been there, and only so many men know the horror of war and the fear that they must suffer it, no matter the war's suspected atrocities, because societies are made, in part, by the men who have fought. I told her that the importance of war is never decided within years, and certainly not within months, but rather in decades or even centuries. After V-Day, the vision of the victors is obscured by champagne and skirts and parades, increased profit, decreased loss and joy, for the war is over and the enemy is dead. The war is over and the enemy is dead. I said, the value of every war is negligible. She thought I was full of shit and told me so. You are fucking full of shit. You go to Germany and tell them about valueless war. I told her that the problem with believing your country's battle monuments and deaths are more important than those other nations is that the enemy disappears, and it becomes as though the enemy never existed. That those names of dead men proudly carved on granite monuments cause a forgetting of the enemy, of the humans who died and fought in their cottons, and the received understandings of war changes so that the heroes from one's own country are no longer believed to have fought against a national enemy, but simply with other heroes. And the war scar is no longer a scar but a trophy. The warrior becomes the hero, and the society celebrates the death and destruction of war, two things the warrior never celebrates. The warrior celebrates the fact of having survived, not of killing Japs or Krauts or Gooks or Ruskies or Ragheads. That large and complex emotional mess called national victory holds no sway for the warrior. It is necessary to remind civilians of this fact, to make them hear the voice of the warrior. These are the things I told the German women. Back inside the cafe, the women joined the German climbers who were sitting in a circle on the floor and the Germans talked about us and laughed. I heard them call us jawheads and throughout the night I considered fighting the laughing Germans. The women too, beating them all severely. But I read my book and I kept my fist to myself. Fergus and I drank coffee and read late into the night, but didn't speak. And later, as we arrived at the barracks, he said, what was their problem? At the end of the day, at the end of all this, we're sending the same kids into war, tricking ourselves into thinking that we will be better because organizations like the VA exist. But we all know how horrible the VA is and how much the government will not, will fight to not help the veterans that it just used and abused and then tossed to the side. We aren't doing any better. If we aren't changing our perception and the way that we are treating these people as humans, as citizens in our country, we're not doing any better. And we can't justifiably ask them to fight for our freedom or the freedom of another country if we're going to bring them home and treat them like fucking assholes. It doesn't work that way. You can't ask them to be a warrior and then treat them the way that these German women did. It doesn't work that way. Just because you don't approve, if you want them to do the, the freedom fighting, this is what happens, and you have to treat them with respect. And I'm not asking you to suck their dick. I'm telling you to take care of them. These men are damaged. One of them tried to murder his friend in the desert. The other one shot other people because they tried were hurting another person. These people are damaged. They're broken. And we shove them to the side and ignore them instead of trying to help them. We can't do this anymore. No government and no person has the right to use you up and throw you to the side. 
This senseless war needs to stop. Whether it's what happened in Afghanistan, what we're doing in Ukraine, this is just murder. And to me, that is the message to be taken from this book. Okay, so this finishes up our review of Jarhead, right, of 2022. The final book was excellent. We're going to slide now into the preview. 